and welcome to another episode of What Works, a conversation series that we put uh, different people in the spotlight who have experiences or knowledge about how to handle life's biggest questions, the challenges of being alive. So with me today, I have Dr. Fritjof Capra. I'm really honored to that you take time to, to do this with me. And I'm curious about what we will find out together. Um, I, I wanna say right off the start, you have really good web page. So if, you, if people who listen oh, to this want you. to know more, we will make sure they get the info they know, need to, to connect to you but through the websites. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I really look forward to this conversation. Yeah. And I love how you pronounce my first name because that people usually mispronounce it. But since it's a Scandinavian name, you have that, no problem. That would probably be the only thing I would pronounce correctly today. It's not <laughs> my first language. But so so I was I had a lot of time to think about how to start this interview. And I, I think I have a a way of getting into some kind of uh, dimension that, that we can start in. So let me show you two symbols. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is this. Mm -hmm. And it, well, you can interpret it in many ways, but I, my interpret interpretation is it's the tree of life. So you have a tree with the branches and a little bird yeah. you can see here. Oh, yes. So yes. this is this is the this is for this conversation. I I, I will use this as the symbol for science, mm -hmm. the thing outside of us that we can see, measure, and taste, and smell. So this is the science part. Then we have another symbol. I think this is familiar to you. Yes. No, and this this I, I have one on on my desk. Oh, look at that. <laughs> So, so uh, for the conversation's sake, I, 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 I think uh, this can represent um, uh, the spiritual side of uh, life, and maybe also you could call it the inner, which we're not not able to measure or see. Mm -hmm. So, when I when I read about you and read your books, I, I find this being a, a kind of a movement you've been doing your whole life. That's right. That's right. So, so how how do we connect to both of those words without do, doing uh, becoming fanatic about one side of them? So, yeah. so maybe a, a first question. If it's okay, if we go di di directly into yeah, it. Sure. Uh, it's a big question, but feel free to to start wherever you like. So what would you say is the basic pattern that connects those two dimensions? Well, let me let me give you a little bit of a, a historical context. Uh, as you know, I was trained as a physicist and I spent 20 years doing research in theoretical high energy physics. And uh, in the 1960s, when I discovered parallels between the uh, basic concepts of quantum theory and relativity theory and the basic ideas of uh, Eastern spiritual traditions, such as this beautiful uh, myth and metaphor of uh, the dancing god Shiva. When I discovered that, I, I got very excited and I explored them in, in some depth and then wrote a whole book about them, which is my first book, The Tao of Physics. Yeah. So that is uh, a comparison between uh, spiritual traditions and the concepts of modern physics. And life did not enter there because <laughs> physics does not deal with life. Although, of course, the Eastern mystics often talk about life and, and, we, uh, and I wrote about consciousness and about you know, the nature of mind and perception and so on. So indirectly, life was part of it, but I did not address the question, what is life in, in, in the Tao of physics. So then when the book became um, very well known, 
and I got invited to lots of lectures and seminars. I met people from all walks of life, and many of them told me that a similar change of concepts and ideas to the one that happened in physics in the 1920s, which I describe in the book, a similar change was, not was now happening also in their fields. And their fields would be medicine and healthcare, you know, psychotherapy, uh, anthropology, economics, I mean, you name it, you know, lots, lots and lots of disciplines. Uh, and there were, you know, artists, architects, designers, and so on. And so I became interested in those fields. And in particular, I sort of branched out and started looking at the history and underlying philosophy of biology psychology and economics in in addition to physics yeah. and and this resulted in my second book the turning point the first was published in 1975 the second in 1982 and while i was writing the book i realized <clears throat> that the issues i was addressing healthcare or or psychology, or you know, politics, economics, social justice, relationships of power, and so on. At a certain point, I realized that they all had to do with life. And my initial approach was to say, well, you had the old Newtonian physics that influenced all the other sciences. And I showed this in detail in the book. So you have a Newtonian psychology, a Newtonian economics, a Newtonian biology, and so on. And so then I said, now we have the new physics with all these new concepts, and it can be a model for a new medicine, a new biology, a new economics. But then I, I realized there's a flaw in this argument. As I said, physics has nothing to say about the nature of life. And so I had to look for a broader framework and uh, I should say one of the key influences at that time who pointed out that flaw to me was Gregory Bateson, yeah. whom I met during the last two years of his life. He died in 1980 and I spent a lot of time with him during the last two years of his life. And so uh, through Bateson, I got interested in systems theory, general systems theory, cybernetics, and systems thinking in general. And uh, you know, now I was able to, to really connect spirituality with, with life, but it's not a direct connection because, and this would take us some time to get into, uh, you know, spirituality is uh, an expression of human consciousness, and, and consciousness is a particular kind of mind or cognition which is connected with life. So mm. we go from life to cognition to consciousness to spirituality. And, and, but, but the connection, of course, is, is, you know, very important and powerful. So... So thank you for, I, I was, uh, there's so many, so many questions you can say about what you just said. Uh, I, uh, I'm also, uh, I'm, I, I've never met Gregory Bateson. I talked with Nora Bateson a couple of times and I love the, the way he describes reality from different disciplines. So it, when, when, if we, so, before we go into uh, more into that, I, I would like to just stop on a personal note because I, I know this all started from uh, an experience, well, who knows where things start, but in your description of, of the story of what happened, you had your own kind of experience that was kind of, I don't know if you would call it spiritual, but it, it made something happen with you and I interpret it as some kind of spark started. Yes. You were on a beach. You probably told this story many times, but I don't know if yes. everyone who's listening now have heard it. So would it be possible if you could? Yeah, well, I, context I and what happened? Since, 
since I wrote about it in the opening pages of the Tao of Physics, I have uh, been calling it uh, my epiphany on the beach. Epiphany on the beach. Okay. The epiphany on the beach. So what happened was uh, I was uh, a young uh, postdoctoral researcher in California at the University of Santa Cruz. Uh, and uh, this was my second postdoc job. I, I graduated in Vienna, got my PhD there in theoretical physics, and then worked in Paris for two years and then moved to California. And already in Paris, I had become very interested in Eastern philosophy. I read the Bhagavad Gita and I read books about Zen Buddhism by Alan Watts and D.T. Suzuki. And uh, so I had sort of studied Eastern philosophy on the side while also, you know, pursuing my physics research. Uh, then I mo moved to California and I got caught up in this whole counterculture of the 1960s. This was 1968, 69, 70 in, the, in those years. And so there I, I read more about Eastern philosophy. I actually met some of the key proponents. I met Alan Watts in California. I met Krishnamurti in California. And so, and I, I started practicing meditation. And like so many people in those days, I experimented with psychedelics. And so all that combined to a very strong interest in, in Eastern philosophy. And uh, already, before this experience on the beach, I recognized, in fact, already in Paris, I recognized some significant parallels between physics and Eastern spirituality, in particular between the, the strange puzzles that physicists were facing in quantum theory described very vividly by Werner Heisenberg and the, the koan method in the Zen teachings. That was a significant parallel that, that I discovered in Paris. And then when I moved to California, this continued. And so one day I was uh, sitting on a beautiful beach in, uh, on a late uh, summer day uh, in, in the late afternoon uh, in meditation. And uh, people uh, have often asked me whether I was high on drugs or, or whether I was meditating. And I can say with certainty that I was meditating and not high on drugs because in those days, you know, I smoked a lot of marijuana and uh, we always did it communally. I, I never smoked a, a marijuana joint as it was called the Mariana cigarette, Mariana cigarette alone. So on the beach, I know I was alone. Mm -hmm. So I was, and you know, meditating on the beach was a big, big fashion at the time. You know, it was a very in thing to do. Yeah. So I was there, I was there doing breath meditation and trying to harmonize my breathing with the very regular surf of the waves coming in, in, in very regular rhythm. And so as I was harmonizing my breath, all of a sudden I experienced the whole environment surrounding me as being involved in a gigantic cosmic dance. Yeah. Now, at the time, being a theoretical physicist in particle physics, I knew that the rocks and the sand and the water and the air consisted of molecules and atoms, which, which are constantly vibrating. That's the energy of heat, it's molecular vibration. I also knew that these atoms consisted of particles and that the particles interacted with one another by exchanging other particles. Furthermore, I knew that the atmosphere of the earth is constantly bombarded by particles of very high energy called cosmic rays. So I knew all of this from uh, the mathematics, the theories, the equations, the data, but in that epiphany on the beach, uh, this knowledge sort of became alive. Mm -hmm. And 
I felt and I heard and I saw in a certain way this cosmic dance. And that, at that point, I knew that this is what the Hindu sages meant when they talked about Shiva Nataraja, the king of dancers, that, that the god Shiva personifies the cosmic dance of the whole universe. Mm -hmm. In other words, the nature of reality is intrinsically dynamic. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a constant dance. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas I had discovered parallels to um, modern physics before, and I had even taken some notes, at that point, that epiphany uh, really uh, triggered my desire to go into greater depth, mm. and I ended uh, writing, uh, ended up writing the Tao of Physics. That was really the impetus. Yeah. So the impetus, the interest first was intellectual, mm. but the impetus was then emotional, very strongly emotional, because you know a meditative experience is an emotional experience. So that is so so uh, interesting because uh, we will get into it maybe in, in a little while. How intellectual knowledge has a certain quality, but combined <clears throat> with that experience, you something more happens, and the, what you call desire or drive uh, may, made you go into further explorations and 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 find out more and more things about this. I, I think a lot of what you uh, have done is kind of keep being curious about that and see yes. how, and, how, how things connect. And, and the emotional drive was strong enough to overcome uh, various obstacles yes. because uh, uh, it, it turned out not surprisingly uh, that when I returned to Europe and and uh, did uh, continued my research at Imperial College in London, and when I had the idea of writing this book, they told me, you know, we are sorry, but we can't fund writing a book on Eastern mysticism, and and you have to leave, you know, and so I lost my position there, and and I I spent two or three years uh, teaching in high school, mm. uh, doing technical translations from uh, English to German, German being my native language, yeah. and, and doing various jobs, you know, to, to make a living until I got an advance from a publisher for writing the Tao of Physics. Mm. But I, I went through a time of, uh, you know, considerable financial hardship um, fortunately, uh, just before that period, I had been totally absorbed by the, the hippie culture, you know, in, in California. And so, you know, I lived with very little money, you know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, sleeping in, in people's living, room, in living rooms in my sleeping bag and hitchhiking and and cooking vegetarian food myself and a very simple life. Mm. And, and so then in London, when I had to live a simple life because of financial uh, constraints, mm. if I, I was okay with it. You know? yeah, I, I, I see. So, uh, so something carried you through all that and, and, and I have kept you going. Uh, what would you say that is? Yeah, well, uh, I saw these parallels between physics and Eastern mysticism so clearly and so consistently, not just one parallel, but, but many and, and interconnected and consistent, that I was absolutely certain that if I didn't write that book now, somebody else would write it. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is knowledge that will come out. Yeah. And in fact, you know, afterwards, after finishing the book, mm. I, I realized that several people were working on similar books or had already written a manuscript. Yeah. And there was one interesting experience I had when I was still at Imperial College. And that was that um, when I had this experience on the beach, 
I um, represented it in a photo montage showing a dancing Shiva uh, superimposed by particle tracks, mm -hmm. which is published in the Tao of Physics. And some editions have it on the cover even. And uh, I had a big uh, print of this photo montage. That was the first thing I did actually before writing anything. Mm. I, I uh, created a nonverbal expression of the parallels between physics and Eastern mysticism. Mm. And it so happened that at Imperial College, I shared an office with an Indian physicist. Ah. And so I thought I would show him, unfortunately, I don't remember his name and I've tried to find out his name and I, I couldn't. That was in, in 19, maybe 70, 71. So I showed him this photo montage and he started to weep. Yeah. And he told me that it was immediately obvious to him what was meant. Yeah. And he said he was so sad because he had left behind his Indian heritage mm. when he became a physicist. And he told me he was brainwashed by Western science. Mm -hmm. And so that I now discovered the parallels to his cultural and spiritual heritage was deeply moving for him. And mm. that of course was a big experience for me too and confirmed me further. And then, then that's when I started writing the book in London. Okay. So uh, let me see if I, we can connect this, what, what you have been talking about, uh, and uh, move into some kind of uh, systemic language that, 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 uh, right. that carries the same kind of uh, um, patterns, maybe is a good word. I love that word. Patterns is a good word. So, yes. so let me see if I can give a, a, a short in question about something that is infinite <laughs> mm. so so i think you if you i don't know if you disagree or agree with this but um it, whether we're talking with about spirituality quantum mechanics or or systemic there seems to be one pattern that repeats itself within the human dimension and that uh, and, and i will try to frame it pretty concise. I think one way of describing it is when we perceive reality through our senses, we see shapes and forms. Now, in the interpretation of those shapes and forms, we confuse difference and contrast with separation we think that these shapes and forms are separated from each other and isolated parts. But you could look at the same reality and see that there are all just shapes, colors and forms, but there actually are no gaps. So the, yeah. the, the, the confusion starts when we see yourself as a part disconnected from nature and act from that kind of framework. To yeah, me, that, that is one way of uh, trying to introduce uh, a more systemic, interconnected, relationship-bound way of looking at reality instead yeah. of a mechanical, fragmented Way. Yeah, I, I think that's, that? that, that's, that's very well put. And that is indeed the very essence of uh, the difference between the mechanistic worldview and the systemic view, and also the, the spiritual view, uh, to move from separate objects to make a shift of uh, perspective from objects to relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, we should also say that that dealing with separate objects is quite necessary on a practical level. Yeah. So when I cross the street and the car come along, comes along, you know, I had better treat it as a separate object because otherwise yeah. I get into trouble. I, so I, it call is, it, I call it fun, a functional hypnosis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's a good approximation, as we would say in science, to deal with separate objects. But the big 
uh, recognition in quantum physics in the 1920s was that at the atomic and subatomic level, this separation cannot be made. You cannot correctly describe the behavior of an electron or a proton or an atom if you treat them as objects, as separate objects. That was the big uh, uh, discovery. So there was this shift from objects to relationships. And then, you know, in the Tao of Physics, I quote, uh, you know, sages like uh, the Buddhist Nagarjuna, uh, you know, who, who, who says the same thing. The essence is there are no objects, there are only relationships. Uh, or, or there's an, an earlier Buddhist uh, uh, scholar uh, who writes, when the mind is disturbed, the multiplicity of things appears. Yeah. And when the mind quiets, the multiplicity disappears and you have all of these relationships. And uh, of course, that was also uh, the, the development in uh, systems thinking, in, in biology, in psychology, in ecology. It's, it's very interesting that in the early 20th century, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, there was a period where in several sciences, this shift from objects to relationships happened and they were also in contact with one another. There were interdisciplinary di dialogues between biologists who called themselves organismic biologists, psychologists who called themselves gestalt psychologists, gestalt being a perceptual pattern, mm. and ecologists who mm. discovered, who studied the relationships of organisms in an ecosystem. Mm. And so all these people uh, were in dialogue with one another and they all had the same experience, uh, the same, they drew the same conclusion that uh, a living system, an organism or a community or an ecosystem, a living system uh, cannot, has properties that cannot be reduced to those of the smallest parts. That mm. was the Cartesian uh, mm. approach. So in an organism or in an ecosystem, the behavior of the whole is different from the sum of the parts. Mm. And that of course gave rise to this famous phrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So so if, 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 if we would try to go from, from from this uh, um, abstract way of creating language about reality and, and try to translate it into practicality. Let's see what happens. I'm, I'm, I see myself basically, uh, basically as a family therapist and, you, and I have a lot of help of the systemic view to, to <clears throat> navigate when I work with families or groups. So, so Let's see if, if this makes sense as a question. We have a tendency to, to rely a lot of information. This is the most information occupied society ever right. existed. So we have a lot of information. And, and if we go to the theme of this podcast is what works when we come to challenge, challenging situation in life. So, so if we if we narrow down to a system defined as a family, where there is some kind of suffering, uh, with all the information we have today, you would think we would know how to handle those situations. You can open any paper and see self help guidance or mm -hmm. read, uh, listen to YouTube. There's a lot of information. And, and as you know, <clears throat> Dr. Kapra, this is, this is a pattern that, that you can see even if you go to society or nations or, or global uh, domain, that it doesn't seem to be enough with the information. Something more needs so we can go from thinking to doing. Yeah. Well, so what's uh, your thought about, thoughts about that? 
I was I was very inspired in in this context by the uh, Czech playwright and statesman Václav Havel. Mm. Uh, in the late 1990s, uh, Havel uh, created a symposium which he called Forum 2000 to discuss the state of the world what, and what can be done. And he invited a number of uh, philosophers, scientists, activists, uh, former Soviet dissidents and, and people like that to Prague, to his residence in the Prague castle for a symposium of several days. He did this during several years and, and I participated in two of those. And in the first one, which I think was in 97, he opened it with an opening address. And in this opening talk, he said, uh, today, we can have any kind of information at our fingertips with our computers. So education today is not the, the uh, accumulation of information. He said education is the ability to see the hidden connections between things. Yeah. And I was so impressed mm. by that mm. because that's of course systemic thinking. Yeah. And I was so impressed that I wrote, that I called the book that I was working on at the time, The Hidden Connections. Yeah. That's, that's from Havel's mm. phrase. And so I think uh, that that is also relevant to the example you bring about family therapy. Uh, you have uh, symptoms, you have what you people call an identified patient, uh, a member of the family, and then uh, the, the therapy consists in uh, exposing or, or revealing the hidden connections mm. between these uh, family members. And of course, not only that, but all, also putting the family into a broader context, yes. environmental, social, political, and, and so on. So, so this is, uh, Again, you know, systems thinking is all about uh, connections. Mm. But I want to come back to what I just said a little while ago, when I said, you know, this phrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Uh, my, my colleague, Pierluigi Luisi, with whom I wrote uh, this uh, textbook, which I have here, The Systems here. of Life, very good. <laughs> So this is, this is a grand synthesis of my whole life's work. Uh, you know, systemic thinking and its, its various origins and applications. And uh, Luisi uh, wrote a passage about reductionism, about Cartesian reductionism, which is very clear and very illuminating. And he said that, uh, the structure of a complex system is composed about is composed by smaller structures mm. so you know a cell is composed of molecules you know an organism is composed of cells uh, a, a star is composed of certain chemicals what whatever the system is the structure is composed of smaller units mm. But that does not mean that the properties can be explained in terms of smaller units, because the properties are a consequence, not only about of the structure, but of the processes and the relationships among the components. Mm. And so that's the big difference. Yes. So, so um, when, when we go, so, I realize you can go on so many levels and, and, and the way we talk is kind of the way the potential story of what is happening collapse into one single story and excludes all the others. So, so when we're talking about family, we have already defined a little bit <coughs> of where, uh, where, what our options are. And, and when we're talking therapy, we are narrowing it down all, a little more. What are the options to, to go from suffering to healing or to some kind of quality that is uh, longed for. So if, if we stay in that kind of context, 
and, and we're talking about patterns. Maybe this is a way of getting some kind of grip on it because you can, you can know that things are not good for you and we still seem to do them. We can look at a single person or relationships or the yes. whole planet, ecology. It doesn't seem to be enough with just information about how much to exercise, what to eat. We still seem to go against that kind of knowledge. Yes. And, and so I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure out maybe there's, there's a difference between what you believe and what you know. Yes, absolutely. Or, or in, in, in other words, there is a, a difference between facts and information on the one side and values on the other. Yeah. And, and when you look at where this comes from, you find that this is a very fundamental property of human consciousness. Yes. Uh, the ability to form abstract images. And mm -hmm. we spoke about this before when we spoke about the separation of objects, which is an abstract image. But uh, human consciousness has the ability to form uh, mental images, abstract mental images, mm -hmm. And uh, because of this ability, we can have ideas about the future, we can plan about the future, we can have desires, we can have goals, we can have designs. And since uh, living beings, not only humans, but all living beings have their characteristic individuality, uh, your idea of the future may not be the same as my idea of the future. And so that creates values and conflicts. Yeah. And these values are very strong. Mm -hmm. There have been very interesting studies that uh, when people have a certain value about the future and a certain idea of the future, for instance, with, with climate change now, this is very relevant. Uh, you know, scientists, have all the documentation and have all the knowledge to show that you know we are on the road to disaster mm -hmm. and yet you know people who for example own stocks in fossil fuel companies mm -hmm. have different values mm -hmm. and arguments will not convince them mm -hmm. they will in fact even go back further and mm -hmm. and entrench more in their values mm -hmm. So what you have to do is to address values head on mm -hmm. and bring, you know, values and ethics, ethics onto yeah. the table. For yeah. example, you know, their love of their children or, or with some of them, the love of nature, you know, do you want to lose that? You know, do you want to yeah. your grandchildren or great grandchildren to perish, you know, because they won't have clean drinking water, things like that. Yeah. So, so it's a huge difference between values and and knowledge and information. Yeah. So, so that that um, that comment you made is like there's a almost like a riddle in it because if we if we're talking about uh, words are tricky because they kind of always there's this kind of image we're doing both of us are doing it now so sometimes the image kind of match maybe sometimes they don't it's hard to know but when you said that about facts and and beliefs or um, yeah, different kind of understanding reality I w this is something i i don't know if there ever will be a, a straight answer on it but i will try and see what what, what what's your response is is that if we're talking about beliefs, what we believe and what we know, and we go to uh, know the the way of knowing, if we would connect it to the word truth, we say that there are facts. Uh, uh, is there is there an actual truth that is stand the test of time that is unchanging? 
the other side of this is kind of more of a relative beliefs that are the best of our ability right now, but they are constantly changing. But is there an absolute truth, Dr. Capra? Do you think so? Well, uh, I would say that there is no absolute truth that can be expressed in words mm. because words are limited and knowledge like scientific knowledge or philosophical knowledge, uh, you know, based on experience is also limited in its expression expressions. Mm. And so in that sense, there is, there is no absolute truth. In fact, in science, this has been uh, a big discovery, maybe the biggest discovery in the 20th century, that since everything is interconnected and uh, the properties of any part uh, derive from the connections to other parts, mm. so in order to describe anything completely uh, with that would truth would be a complete match yeah. between the phenomenon and the description. Mm. We would have to describe all the infinite connections, which obviously is impossible. Yeah. And this is why science does not deal with absolute knowledge, but always with relative knowledge, with approximate and, and uh, uh, you know, limited knowledge. Mm. So this, this has been the great discovery. But, uh, you know, you could you could say that truth can lie in experience. You know, you can experience something, hmm. and and uh, maybe you could even say that uh, in artistic expression, hmm. you come closer to the, to the truth. Yeah. Uh, there there was a a famous Indian scholar Kumaraswamy, I think it was Ananda Kumaraswamy. And he said, myth is the closest you can come to truth. So mythological knowledge. And he was actually talking about the dance of Shiva. Mm. He, he wrote an article called the dance of Shiva. And he said, myth is the closest the human mind can come to truth. Mm. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that artistic expression, you know, in, in, a, in a symphony or, you know, in a, in a jazz improvisation. Right. Or, or in a dance, you know, it's it's the closest you can come to truth. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I thank you for giving such a interesting answer, and I'll I'll, I'll digest that for a while. I, I I still think that is the language that we ordinarily use usually com confuse those dimensions so we talk as if we're talking truth as yes. that we know what's right what's wrong what's here what's there yes. but but there's some kind of you become humble when you look at it from this point of view the best answer is always i don't know and then we can start yes. but if you start with what i know you're obviously limiting yourself and the possibilities yes. to explore yeah, actually, in, in science, there is a middle way, you know, okay. we don't say I know or I don't know, but we say I know approximately. Yeah. This is what a scientific model is or a scientific theory. It's mm. an approximate description of reality. Mm. And uh, we are ready, if we are good scientists, mm. we are ready to modify it or even to throw it out. Yeah. If new uh, phenomena appear and new uh, observations are made that contradict the model. So, so I, 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 I'm almost disagreeing a little bit because I, I would like to think that what you're saying is what I'm experiencing. But I, my experience is that science, some part of the scientific world are really invested in their own old beliefs and there's a really hard challenge to introduce new concepts or challenge the old concepts because there's a lot of other forces involved in, in the scientific. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. And, you know, scientists are, are human and they are flawed human. We are all flawed human beings. Yes. And so uh, I think any 
competent scientists, when you take a competent economist or psychologist or biologist and you sit them down and you say, listen, when you formulate a scientific theory, is that the absolute truth or is it an approximate description? Then they would say, of course, it's an approximate description. That's what science is. Yeah. But then they behave as if it were <laughs> the absolute truth and defend it as if it were the absolute truth in a very dogmatic way. Yeah. And I think the, uh, the reason is also uh, that emotions are stronger than, than the rational mind. Yeah. Because, you know, if you, if you are a 50-year-old university professor who has written a very successful textbook and made a lot of money with that and mm -hmm. is, you know, very, very famous, and then some new data come up that invalidate your theory. Mm. You're not going to rewrite the textbook right away. You're going to defend your theory first as, as long as you can. Well, you could you could translate that into actual uh, ordinary life also. If you have uh, invested yourself in an identity with really yes. strong beliefs, you're kind of questioning your whole identity to change yes. you. And that is we know that is a hard thing to do. So, so yes. the, the, um, I, I love the way you said that, because I think you answered the previous question now with, with um, how come we don't act on the information we have, where you said yeah. emotions are stronger than rational thinking. Yeah. I was just thinking when you, when you spoke about identity, I was thinking about gender identity, mm -hmm. which is such a relevant topic now. Yeah. You know, when, when, when I grew up, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, there were boys and girls and, and that was it. And, yeah. and we, we knew about homosexuality, mm. but we didn't know about the difference between sexuality and sex and gender. Mm. And we didn't know about transgender people and, you know, all kinds of things mm. that, that we know today. And mm. of course, the majority still denies that today. Mm. The, the establishment still tries to deny it. But that's a huge revolution, yeah. which which sort of challenges our our own identity. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And, and and this is one way. The the, the hidden um, pattern is that life seems to find ways to show up, and 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 we uh, in periods of time we we for some reasons are available to change and do th these big paradigm shifts happens. Yes. And, and, and so I would like to, this is a question that you can answer from many different kind of angles, but I, I was thinking this, um, the connection between crisis and creativity. What would, what, what would you say? Because in one way they are connected when we talk about change, so 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 people don't change. All nature uh, has a tendency to. If we're talking systemic, you you reach a tipping point and something happens, right. uh, right. a, a re revolution or a, a disease or. or yeah. and this then is uh, this is another big discovery, a big recent scientific discovery that was made in complexity theory. You know, chaos theory, nonlinear dynamics, yeah. all, all these mathematical theories. And that is what is known as the phenomenon of emergence. Yeah. That nonlinear systems and all living systems, all living organisms, social systems are nonlinear systems. So let's just say living systems, as we all know, are able to maintain themselves in a state of balance for a long time. But every now and then they will encounter a point of imbalance at which the system as a whole may either break down mm. or may break through to a new balanced state. And mm. this breakthrough is known as the emergence, the spontaneous emergence of novelty mm. at critical points of instability. Mm. And I think that is the connection between crisis and creativity because 
<clears throat> the emergence of novelty is an expression of life's creativity. Yeah. And it, it originates in crisis. Mm. So if you, if you wish, crisis is the mother of creativity. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's how they are connected. So, so, wow. I should, I should add that, um, you know, one of the uh, scholars who influenced me a lot was the Scottish psychiatrist, Adi Lyne. Mm. And Lyne, to my knowledge, was the first who said uh, a crisis uh, need not necessarily be breakdown, it can also be breakthrough. Yeah. And, and he, he said that speaking about psychotic episodes, mm. uh, you know, schizophrenia, mental illness in general, mm. and he, he advocated a very humane approach mm. um, to psychotic patients of uh, letting them live the process of crisis uh, and emergence of a, a healthier state. Uh, and this, um, uh, he, he wrote about this, I believe, in the 1960s, whereas complexity theory and this whole mathematics of emergence began in the late 1970s and 1980s. Mm. So he was a very keen observer who was way ahead of his time. And so, some, yeah, yeah uh, some of these um, um, reactions that we encounter in life, uh, I, as you probably think the same, we wouldn't choose them. But when we look at life afterwards, we realize uh, something. What we benefited from what happened, even though we wouldn't have sh sh made a choice to do it, or uh, so. So that you can always hear this in life stories. Well, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, but yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be the one I am if it wouldn't have happened. So, so there's yeah. something in that we can relate to. So I just want to check with you. Uh, uh, we have a little more time. Is that possible for yeah, you? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. What you, what you just said, by the way. <clears throat> reminds me of my grandmother who was a very wise woman uh, and and she used to say you never know what it's good for <laughs> yeah 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 i know there's a same story that is similar when when the, there's this uh, peasant who who has a son and uh, the and there's a war going starting and and just before the war started, the boy falls from a horse and broke his leg. And everybody in the village go and tell him, oh, it's terrible that your son broke his leg. And he only answers, maybe. And then they, they come and they draft everybody except the boy with the broken leg. Yeah. Uh, and the story continues with the yeah, same yeah. approach yeah. that you never know. Yeah. And, and right. afterwards, you create a story about it that makes some kind of sense. So yeah. when you were talking now, uh, something has been turning around in my head uh, since I think one of the things uh, that I feel connected with you is that you have the courage to talk about these kind of different disciplines and including the Eastern mysticism uh, and, and, and still being really clear and, and uh, obviously you have a, a, a bunch of books and people love to meet with you and talk so the, there is a, a, a a need to connect the dots, I think. So I was thinking of, of sharing a little story with you in, in this mm. later part of the interview, just to, to see how, how strange things can seem. So I was, um, uh, 2017, I was sitting on a plane from Washington, going back to Sweden, being on a psychotherapy conference, and we were flying between time zones. You know, there's a big time difference between uh, USA and Sweden so mm -hmm. it's a bit confusing about what time it was and it was actually mm -hmm. also the day when we shift from winter to summertime in Sweden oh yeah nobody yeah. really knew what the time was and I was sitting on the plane and a bit jet lag you know confused traveling between countries mm -hmm. and I was playing around with how language is a representation of life and then uh, since this was time thing was happening I just, my mind shifted into thinking about how time 
is also kind of a representation because the clock time is one thing. Then I thought about experience time and all of a sudden this strange thing happened. So I couldn't tell where my inside stopped and my outside start. I couldn't tell if the voices I heard was from the people besides me or inside me. Mm -hmm. And this was really strange. It wasn't a, uh, a, a it wasn't a fearful experience, but mm -hmm. I thought it was about sleep deprivation. So I, I didn't uh, I didn't think much more of it. But I couldn't stop being um, surprised how I couldn't really define where I was. Yes. And then I got off the plane, uh, didn't tell anyone, thought I might be losing my mind a little. So mm -hmm. I, I, I must get some sleep. So I was leaning on the wall on the airport waiting for my train and people were passing by. And the, the, um, the amazing thing was it was still happening. When I looked out, it wasn't just the voices, the people that was going by was as, as if I was looking inside my body and seeing all the organs connecting to each other but what I was experiencing was that everybody that was walking by was me it was yeah. one that and it wasn't me Johnny the personality but it was something else and I was I couldn't believe what was happening I couldn't understand it there was this little guy that's me here I am here I am yeah. here I am wherever I went so I jumped on the train went home to Yavle my hometown sat down on a park bank and just happened to close my eyes towards the sun and I don't know how long it it took but when I opened my eyes I were full of tears and I had this it's hard to explain in words but I had this really uh, strong feeling that everything was okay everything is yeah. perfect yeah. so I went home That's beautiful and that's I a beautiful tell. experience yeah. because you had your epiphany on the bench. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, and, and that, that is a kind of the spark that led me to trying to explore different kinds of way of understanding this uh, reality with maybe some kind of systemic uh, basic baseline. And uh, mm -hmm. this is why I'm sitting here with you today because. Wonderful. Uh, Yes, it, it kind of uh, creates the, some kind of desire or spark to share this with others. So if they have the similar experience, they, they will have something to hold on to. The, That's that wonderful. Because you can, you can well, call that... Those, such... those, are, those are wonderful bookends to our conversation. So yeah. you have <laughs> Epiphany on the beach and your Epiphany on the bench. Yeah. So, so there's so much I would love to talk with you more than this, but I, I, will, I would just it. like to add that if people are interested in, yeah. in getting deeper into the ideas I discussed with you, of course, you know, I've written several books and especially this book, The Systems View of Life with Pierluigi Luisi. And I also teach this book because this is a textbook and I teach it in an online course called Capra course. Yeah. And I have taught this course now for over five years to over 2000 people. And as we said before, when you are online, you are global. So in my students come from 86 countries around the world. And I teach the course twice a year in the spring and in the fall. And it consists of 12 weekly lectures, which are pre-recorded. And there's also a discussion forum in which I participate every day. So I'm in contact with the course participants, you know, online every day. Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to go deeper into that, uh, welcome to join our network of uh, systemic thinkers and activists. That's wonderful. Is it possible to, to tell us what, what's the name of the Capra course website? Yeah, it's capracourse.net. Okay, yeah. Very simple. So, so if you guys who have been listening uh, are interested in learning more about Capra and his uh, uh, systemic point of view, check it out. I know I will. And uh, this feels like a, a good place to end this uh, conversation. Great. Well, Capra. thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. It was a really wonderful and interesting and inspiring great. meeting. Thank you. So, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, have a great day. All right, you too. Bye All bye. Right. Bye bye.